Today's guest is a double threat, top writer and editor. His work has been featured in Wired, Film School Rejects, Pro Writing Aid, The Bill Fold, P.S. I Love You, The Writing Cooperative, and he's a top writer in writing, books, creativity, life, while also being an editor for The Writing Cooperative, one of Medium's top publications. He's a professional writer. He's a community builder, he's a donut eater, and he can teach us all about believing in ourselves. Today, on The Rough Draft, I'm joined by Justin Cox. That was an introduction. <laughs> well, you built all of that. You know, how does hearing all of those accolades and where you've been, you've done all that. It's like, how does it feel or how to, to hear that and say, oh, that's me? Well, it, I mean, it was pretty exciting, actually, um, honestly. But uh, I, to credit where credit's due, I've been part of a team with the writing cooperative. There's three of us that, that build uh, that. And so... Um, but yes, it's a lot of work that we've put into it over the last six or seven years now to get it to where it's at today. So, um, hearing it all kind of together like that is, it's, that's pretty cool. And you've, you've built it into, you know, one of the premier publications on Medium and you're one of the premier writers on Medium. So it's in addition to, I might add, is a lot of your pieces you'll interview other top writers. So not only are you creating your own content editing and, and giving guidance to other writers, but you're interviewing and then turning edits. That's three different, those are all three different roles that an individual could fill their time with that you've been able to create three personas to fill all of them for yourself. So it's impressive. Well, thank you. Um, to start with this, um, so we know where you are now. I wanna travel back to where you came from and explore your writing history. So publicly, I can see you've been on the Medium platform since 2017, but you've been doing writing cooperative for six or seven years. So what has been your writer's journey to you know, writing answers to a test in second grade to now where you are today? Yeah, so I, actually I've been on Medium since 2015. 15. I think that member since 2017 is when they first launched their payment, their membership mm -hmm. program. Um, I think I actually might have published my first story on Medium in, in uh, 2014, actually, I think. Uh, so I've been on Medium for a long time. Um, but my, my long and short history of me as a writer, um, I've always kind of been a creative writer. Um, I In high school, the local paper here had a uh, editorial column for high school students called New Voices that I was a contributor to. Um, so that was really my first uh, published byline, if you will, was in the, the local paper here. Um, went to college and took writing classes uh, on the side, um, kind of as electives. I, I majored in entrepreneurship and um, and so there's a lot of marketing writing and business writing that kind of came out of that. Um, and so writing has always kind of been a, a passion, but never my full focus mm -hmm. of career. And so I've just kind of built it as a, a hobby really for years and years. Um, and then really kind of took it seriously um, a number of years ago uh, when we decided to launch the writing cooperative um, into what it is now. And that's when I really spent more time uh, just making sure that my writing was not just amateur style, but, you know, putting some time and effort into editing it. And it's not just a blog. It's it's really something that I'm going to put out there and be proud of and um, and putting the, the time into making sure that everything was polished um, and then learning the skills to edit other people's work, which um, was never my strong suit. Uh, my my English teachers from high school would be the first to tell you that I am the world's worst speller. Um, I hate grammar rules. Um, <laughs> rules are meant to be broken is the way that I look at it. Um, my handwriting is absolutely atrocious. And so I put all those things together and 
you know, I don't have necessarily the ideal uh, writer history, but um, but it's always been a passion, and I've figured out what I need to do to to become skilled at it. So what what was that process? Like? What was that process like when you went from not being a full time writer, not being a full time editor, and understanding, hey, maybe I don't have the natural talent that like the top writer will have because some of these things don't come as easy, but you found a way to make it work and you transitioned into saying, I'm a writer and I'm an editor rather than I write and I edit on the side. Like, I think there's a, a, a difference between how we're identifying as. Yeah. So I, I think that it comes down to taking yourself seriously. And so I, one of the things that I see, so the Writing Cooperative is a publication, like you said, on Medium. It's one of the biggest publications on the platform. Um, we've also got a, um, a community that's global. We, we have uh, a little over a thousand writers in our Facebook group talking about writing and their craft. And, um, and one of the things that I see all the time amongst writers that are new to to putting their work out there is they refer to themselves as aspiring writers or I want to be a writer or you know something along those lines but the way I look at it if you're publishing stuff if you're putting stuff out there you are a writer mm -hmm. and so take yourself seriously and give yourself the credit that you deserve that even if it's you know your first blog or your first website on medium or, or wordpress or whatever it is that you're doing it. You're taking you're taking yourself seriously, and so that's kind of the way that I've looked at my writing. Is um, this isn't just a hobby; it's something that I'm passionate about. So if I'm passionate about it, I want to get better at it. Um, what do I need to do to do that? And so I read a lot. Um, I write a lot of stuff that never gets read by anybody but myself. Um, just kind of letting thoughts get out of my head and. Uh, seeing where they go. Um, and and then I learned how to edit, um, which has never been my strong suit. Um, but it's it's necessary. And a little bit of editing editing makes any piece of writing go from this is just something that is on online that I mean, there's millions of things published every day mm -hmm. to oh, this is actually something that's engaging and, and people will be able to connect with doesn't take much to, to go from one to the other. Um, and in reading other people's submissions, that's the that's the line you can tell if somebody has put some thought and time into their work if they've given it just a little bit of editing that it needs to to go from rough draft to ready for publish. For your personal writer's evolution and learning editing, today when you write, are there certain markers or signals in your writing that a reader could pick up and say, okay, this is a Justin Cox piece. Like, what is it that you think are those markers for you? <laughs> Huh, that's a really great question. Um, so I, my writing can be all over the place, and it really is just kind of where I, I, I I've always said that I write because I have to get the words out of my head, um, and so it just kind of wherever the words take me is where I go. And so I'll write. Um, right now, I'm writing a lot on uh, what I'm calling the intersection of creativity and community. Um, I, if you're familiar with Brene Brown and um, her fantastic Dare to Lead book, um, I read through that last year and she's got a whole segment in there about your core values. And um, I, my core values are creativity and community. And so um, creativity is expressed through uh, writing and community is expressed through the work that I do uh, with writers through the writing cooperative. And so um, right now, I'm writing a lot about how those two things intersect each other and what that looks like in our world. And um, given coronavirus and COVID-19, community is a little bit different today than it was just six weeks ago. And um, and so that's that's where some of, uh, I would say, markers are right now. Um, but I've written about all kinds of different things. And so I, I wrote about... Um, seeing Kia souls everywhere you look um, about two years ago. And I wrote about a um, my struggle with exercising as uh, it relates to Macklemore's uh, song about not wanting to diet and eat everything. 
Um, and so I just, you know, wherever my brain kind of puts the words onto the page is where uh, I let it take me. Um, again, not everything gets published, um, but a lot of it does. And, um, and I don't publish anything I'm not proud of. And so um, it's, it's a matter of seeing where it goes. And when you do decide on something and say, I, I do want to publish this, I'm proud of this work, I've edited it, I believe in it, beyond putting it into one of your two publications, are there other levers that you pull to make sure that you're honoring your words when distributing them? And knowing that you have an entrepreneurship and marketing background, I'd be curious if there's stuff that pops up. I'm like, I have never thought about sending a writing there or, or doing this. What is your relationship to distribution? Yeah, so um, I, nothing gets too uh, published for me unless I've written it in my head about three or four dozen times over the course of a week or two. And so I, I'll get an idea in my head and um, I, I'll literally write sentences in my brain um, until they kind of sound right um, before long before I'm, I'm ever at the computer. Um, and so once once the words are actually on the page um, and then I've given it a couple of edits, I've I've pretty well written a number of different versions of it between my head and on the on the screen. And so um, by the time it's ready for distribution, um, I've kind of gone through it a handful of times. Um, in terms of marketing, um, I'm, I'm, I'll say that I am decent at marketing other people's work, and I am terrible at marketing my own. Um, I, I have, uh, uh, I have the Writing Cooperative has a massive email list um, that I try not to send to, except for once a month. We do a once a month newsletter. I don't want to spam people. Um, and so I have a modest uh, subscription base of my own. Um, but I'm not really like I'll send out once every two weeks or so. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's my latest thing or here's what's going on. Um, and I'll post to Instagram and LinkedIn occasionally if it's a um, leadership esque piece, um, kind of targeting a little bit towards my social networks, depending on what the style of piece that I've written. Um, but beyond that, I'm really not fantastic at marketing my own thing. I, I'm more of a, let me help build other people and help, you know, promote their work. Um, and then what comes for me comes for me. A selfless writer. <laughs> and <laughs> as someone, I, I felt that too in, I, I think I published a couple pieces with the writing co-op and the distribution was awesome. And it's, you know, it's in all these different channels. And when looking at publications, it's something that I really appreciate and respect because there's, there's now hundreds or thousands of publications and a writer sometimes has a bit more power and they can say, oh, I want to go to a publication that's going to honor my work and share it out over one that doesn't. Um, yeah. So I really appreciated that. And there's there's a conversation that always happens with writers, and it's one of the most disagreeable points, which is to write for money. And mm. does it compromise your integrity? And I know you even publicly, and like you're you're very loud about some of your pieces saying, hey, I may have an affiliate link in here. Like I'm not trying to th slide anything past you. It's something I use and I believe in and I think could help amplify your writing. But on just the, the clear question of, is it okay for a writer to want to earn money with their writing? And does that compromise their work? So yes, they should want to earn m money for their writing. And no, uh, it doesn't compromise their work as long as they're honest about it. I mean, you know, that, that's part of taking yourself seriously as a writer is acknowledging that there's a market for your work. Whatever it is, there's a market for it. Um, and I, you know, there's people that they just want to publish freely online um, and just put stuff out there. And that's that's fine um, if that's your end goal. But, but don't be afraid to say, yeah, I want to get paid for my work um, because 
you should want to get paid for your work. Um, and then, but, but you've got to be honest with your, your, uh, audience. And there's so many, um, there's so much content out there that is really just paid advertorials that people are getting paid for sponsorship posts or, um, I, I mean, with the writing cooperative, I get probably two dozen emails a day asking for, um, what our rate is to do a, sponsored post in the publication and i ignore every one of them because mm -hmm. that's not something that we do um but there's people out there that that's all the writing that they do and it's really easy to fall into um believing something is honest and and when it really is not uh, online because some people are really good at writing that kind of content um but the the reality is is i'm a rules person i i follow rules even though i hate grammar rules i love you know structure and organizational rules um and the law in the united states is if you have affiliate links or you've been paid for any kind of writing you have to disclose it and so the fact that um i've got that in there when i have some affiliate links um you know, that's, that's the law, but I, I also do believe in the products that I link to mm -hmm. and it's, I don't link to stuff unless I've either used it personally or have used it in the past. Um, because I just, I, I'm not there to, uh, spam people, but I also know that that's one of the ways that writers can make some money and get paid for their work is, uh, is through that kind of thing. And so, um, so yeah, I'm not afraid to put some of that stuff in there, but, um, but I'll, I'll be honest and disclose it every time. Is it, is it a tempting when you get those one or dozen requests from a brand or a product? Is it ever tempting to just be like, here's a ridiculous price and see if they say, <laughs> oh, sure, yeah, that sounds great. Um, because I admire the, the discipline not to. Because I know yeah. with writing, you can have that wall where it's just like, oh, it'd be so easy just to say yes. Yeah, well, um, most of them are poorly written, so it's easy to ignore them. Um, and and sometimes I feel ornery and I'll mark them as spam because they're really poorly written. Um, and then there's some that it is enticing. Um, and I, I have reached out to some people to talk about what we could do in partnership. Mm -hmm. um, and But never as like, I've never accepted here, here's money. I'm going to put your yeah. stuff on the, 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 um, on the publication it's what can we do together and so a lot of our giveaways all of our giveaways and challenges and writing contests those are partnerships that we've developed over the years with um with brands and writing tools that that i use i mean pro writing aid is one of the um has been really great to us over the years and given us plenty of prize prizes for our community um, but that's a tool that i've been using for three or four years now as well and so um, I'm happy to partner with them because it's a pro product that I actually really like. And so um, beyond the affiliates, there's no money that exchanges for that kind of stuff. It's just, hey, how can we help each other um, market what we do? Discipline, integrity, selflessness. <laughs> it's, these are, might be the, the most admirable, admirable writer um, and editor that I've truly ever, ever met on or off the platform. And I want to get into a couple of my favorite pieces of yours and, and ask some questions about that. But I just want to take a quick break and we'll be back in just a couple of seconds to hear about growth over fear and then something that you call trashing your own art, which will be an interesting one to talk about. So we'll be right back. Did you hear that? You're a writer. You're not an aspirational writer. You're not hoping to be a writer. You are a writer, I think. Hearing that from Justin, someone who's such an established writer and editor, is validating and motivating and hopefully encouraging all writers, all listeners to keep writing and view themselves as a writer. Justin also, in this episode, will go on to talk about believing in yourself and investing in yourself. So I thought it'd be appropriate to talk about a way that I invest in myself, meditation. I have a morning practice. I have an afternoon practice. It's going on a year strong of every single day, and it's such a non-negotiable part of my day. I believe in all of the benefits of it. 
from making me a more empathetic, compassionate, patient person to getting better sleep to being more creative. And what helps me is having a comfortable place to do it. Half Moon Yoga and Meditation, you make an incredible selection of Zabutons, of pillows, of other accessories for meditation practice. And I'm extremely grateful that you exist and that you support the show as a partner and make conversations like this happen. Another way I invest in myself is nourishing my body. I'm not someone who reacts really well to caffeine, so I've looked for beverages that can be made hot or iced that are caffeine-free and sugar-free, and Golden Root Turmeric Latte Mix is checking off all of those boxes. I have it hot, I have it cold, I have it in the morning, I have it at night, and it's a really nice companion. It's a nice beverage companion to have with me, so Golden Root, Thank you for partnering with the show as well and making these conversations happen. Now, let's get back in there and hear more from Justin about his favorite work and some more tips he has for writers from the perspective of an editor. Welcome back to The Rough Draft. Joined today with Justin Cox and we're about to find what it means to trash your art. And I, I read this headline of yours. It says, are you willing to trash your art? And I want to read you what you wrote. And it said, when we're okay with throwing things out we've created, we achieve a power over our lives we don't otherwise have. And when we feel powerful, we can unlock our creativity. Can you tell me what it means to trash my art, how I can learn to do it, and how I can be comfortable doing it? because it feels like a radical thing um, that's uncomfortable. Yeah, so um, I, I <laughs> trash your art. Yeah, that was something that, as I said earlier, I, you know, I get ideas that roll around in my head. And um, I think in, it's in that piece that I tell the story about throwing out the first that um, Eddie Wong talks about in cooking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that, I, Eddie Wong is a, uh, he's a chef in New York City of um, uh, a Bao restaurant called Bao House that um, I, I'm a huge fan of. He's from here in Orlando originally. And so there's that Orlando connection. Um, but I read his autobiography about four or five years ago now. And he tells this story about the idea of throwing out the first, which um, in, in cooking, you cook stuff off to to basically pre-season the the pan and to um, let the fats and all the different stuff do what they're supposed to do, and then you don't eat that. You you literally like season the the pan and the the dish, and then you throw that out. And that's how he cooks his um, one of his signature dishes, and it's how his grandmother taught him how to cook. Um, mm. And so that idea has kind of stuck in my head for years and. Um, I think that that piece about throwing out your art was I had read something about morning pages and uh, there's a lot of people that believe in morning pages and writing a thousand words before you get out of bed or whatever it is. And um, and that's, you know, whatever works for you, fine. That You know, if it works for you, do it. Um, but what what I was really kind of looking at is, you know, who are you creating for? Is it is it for you? Is it for um, is it for an audience? And if you're not willing to just let it all go, then what's the point of it? And so when I create something, I, as I said, it rattles in my brain for a long time. Um, and then I put it out there and it's done. Like I've, I've let it go of my, my, out of my head. Um, and that's probably why I'm not great at marketing myself because once I've hit publish, it's, okay, that's gotten out of the head. What's the next thing that's rattling around? And so um, letting go of your stuff, I think is important. If we hold so closely to it that, um, you know, we're not willing to let it go, then um, we'll just keep it to ourselves and it'll never be shared. And so, um, so yeah, throw out your work. You know, it's kind of radical. Write a bunch of stuff and then hit delete and see, um, see if it's still in your head or if that's that's been enough to to let go of it. it it makes a lot of sense spatially where if you have 100 drafts and mentally you're incubating ideas and words for each one of them 
if you throw out half, okay, now you have yeah. double the space. And yep. I, I believe you just said it, let go of old drafts. And that's something you wrote in Unlock Your Creativity or Three Hours or Less. And it was, hey, clean up some bookmarks, get rid of some apps, get rid of some people you're following, like give yourself more space to operate in your own mind and reserve it for yeah. you. So it's it's something that new, old, existing, any writer, I really think can say, okay, hey, I created it, but I need to be just as comfortable with it going away. And part of that for me was trust myself that I'm going to create new things, that like, I don't just have 100 pieces and that's it. You know, my mind will continue to generate. There, I want to read you another piece of your writing. It says, okay. sometimes the only way we grow is to do things that scare us. How often do we put something aside because we're afraid of the difficulty? Can we talk about redirecting fear and you know not taking it head on? This was in a piece called um, Choosing Growth Over Fear in a Time of Uncertainty. And whew, it, it, it hit me. You know, it, it hit me straight on really about this. We put something away where we defer because it scares us. Mm-hmm. And I can imagine the research and, and the time that went into writing this piece, the self-exploration of it. Um, where did this piece come from and what does it mean to you now today? Yeah, so this is one of my more introspective personal pieces. I, I you know, I, I, I don't really go inward often in my writing. Um, and this was one of those pieces. And it was really out of a response to uh, resigning from a job that I loved that I had for the last 15 years um, and saying, you know what, it's time for something different. And I don't know what that something different is. Um, but I know that for me, it's time to say I need to let go of this um, so that I can figure out what's what's next. And so that um, choosing growth over fear, fear of you know, this is safe and this is something that, you know, I, I have this job and I really, I enjoy it and I'm good at it, but, um, but what else is out there and what's mm-hmm. next and, um, and what am I missing out on by not letting go of this, this career? And so, um, I resigned, I gave 60 days notice with no plan um, at my full-time job uh, the week before the city went into lockdown for coronavirus. And so that uh, choose growth, or sometimes you have to to grow, you have to do some things that scare you. I posted that, uh, just that sentence on LinkedIn and Twitter the day that I uh, gave my resignation. Um, And that was kind of my, like, here we go, we're doing this. And so that piece kind of came out of um, out of that whole experience for me. Uh, because when I resigned, I didn't expect the country and the world to lock down for months. And I didn't expect a global recession. And, um, but I, I don't regret my choice. I don't regret, you know, resigning. I, 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 this, this time of change, this time of, uh, uncertainty, this unique time we're living in, um, I think people are given the opportunity to either choose to grow or choose to just, I'm going to hold on and get through this. And um, and I, I hope that people choose to grow because out of the last six weeks, the amount of innovation I've seen, the amount of creativity I've seen, um, it's it's really, really inspiring. And um, and I think that, you know, we're, we're at this point in, all of our collective lives where if we choose growth right now, um, the world could be a whole different place uh, in the next six to eight months. And, um, and I'm excited to see where that all leads. This was the part of the conversation I was so excited about because (laughs) I, I feel fortunate to have had some sort of front row seat because when we first started engaging as editor writer relationship via email, I think I had seen that LinkedIn status and I was like, Hey, congrats. What's next? And you're like, well, I'm not really sure. And to yeah. me, it was, Oh my God, like someone's going to have complete security and move to something else, which is without security. But what I didn't know was it's like, there's so much belief in yourself and you're allowing yourself to meet this fear because you trust, 
hey, I'm going to grow. I don't know what's coming next, but I trust I'm ready for it. I trust I'm going to, you know, just dive on into it. So it's, wow, it, it's a really, it's reading that again and again. I'll go back after this conversation to read that piece and link it in the show notes for everyone to see that it's something with that context. Um, I want to use the word brave and courage because it it is, you know, it's it's a modern day, such a modern day act of courage where saying, I don't know what happens next and being comfortable with that is is something I really admire. So so thank you for, for opening up about that. On continuing on things I admire, this this switches <laughs> a little bit to to tips for new writers. Yeah. You, I know you recently revamped your website, and if anyone who goes to it, it's it's the Justin Cox splash page. You know, it has everything you need on it with nothing extra, no distraction. It's really here's what I do. Here's where you can find me. Here's where we can chat. It's everything someone needs. Um, and I want to just, you know, what are some new tips, or what are some tips you have for new writers? Stuff that six, seven, a decade ago you would have loved if someone just handed you a note and said, hey, do all these things by the end of this week and you'll be a, in a bit better of a place. Yeah, so I, you know, like I said earlier, I, I really believe that if you want to be a writer, take the aspiring, take all that like, you know, language out of it, call yourself a writer, believe in yourself. Um, and there's a few things that people can do that, that will just make them not only look like they're, a real professional writer, but um, I think these things can build confidence and and uh, help you to believe that you are a writer as well. And so, um, one of the things I mentioned is you know buy a buy a uh, web domain. Um, I was fortunate to buy JustinCox.com about 15 years ago when I was in college, um, and you know I I just kind of on a whim thought, hey, this might be a good idea. Like 2001, 2000, actually, it was probably about 20 years ago now that wow. I bought that domain. And um, it's had various iterations over the, the years. But, um, but yeah, I mean, having that email address that is at justincox.com, um, it conveys a level of professionalism. And so I can't tell you how many writers uh, reach out to me and want to be a part of the writing cooperative that are using Yahoo or aol.com or uh, you name it, I see it. And it, it's fine. All those are great services. But um, for $15 a year, you can buy whatever web domain you want and have a professional looking email address. Um, and it builds the confidence that, hey, like I'm investing in myself and I'm, I'm worth the small amount of money that this is going to cost me um, to be a professional writer. And so um, fifteen dollars for a, a web domain, another handful of dollars for an email account. Um, you know, these are little little investments um, that will pay off in the long run. And even if it all it does is just boost your confidence to be able to send that uh, submission email or that pitch to an editor to say, "Hey, you know, I'm a professional writer and I've got this idea." Um, then that's worth the fifteen dollars it's going to cost you this year to register the mm -hmm. domain. Um, and so that's one of those things that um, that I you know I really believe in. Spend a little bit of money on yourself. Um, the same goes with you know we mentioned Pro Writing Aid, Grammarly. These kind of tools um, they're inexpensive comparatively. I mean, a hundred bucks for the year, um, give or take. Uh, that can help you if you've never edited anything before in your life and you don't know the things to look out for, then those kind of tools are great at flagging some of the big issues. Uh, when I first started using those tools a number of years ago, I realized that I overused the word that. Um, and so it, that is a, uh, a word that uh, it limits your writing. It shows it to me now that I've seen that how it flags so many times in some of my early, earlier works, uh, just removing that simple word makes a huge difference in the sentence. And uh, and I see that in other people's submissions now. So I'm a stickler for uh, overusing the word that or just or uh, any kind of word that hedges um, your, your language. And so $100 for a year to help point out some of those big red flags that you might not see in your own work, 
um, that's you know that's a great investment. That's worth the the, the money and the time. Um, well, is that an extension? Does that plug right into like a Google Doc, or do you have to write inside of their app or platform? So both of them, uh, you can write in their platform. Um, both of them have uh, plugins for Chrome or Safari that work with um, most websites. Medium has a very strange editor uh, in terms of web coding, and so uh, I think uh, I think Grammarly and Pro Writing Aid work with Google, but not with Safari or Firefox. Um, but they work with most things, um, and you know it'll just highlight the the problem areas that you have. And it's not neither of them are perfect. There's no there's no replacement for a, a human editor, um, but they'll you know, they'll hit the big pieces that like, oh, I didn't realize that I overused those words, or I didn't realize that I start every word or every sentence with uh, an ING word, or, you know, those kind of things that even you'll never necessarily see that you overuse these type of things until uh, something points it out. And if you can't afford a human editor at however much per hour, then invest in yourself a little bit with a $100 subscription um, to, to see some of those, those hmm. problem areas. That's great advice. And I think the, the email is one, that's something I, I just got my own domain and heading towards it with, Hey, why have I even, why have I waited a month or why have I waited a month and a half to just set that up? Yeah. And it's, you're so right. Hey, it's like 15 bucks. Or I can't what? tell you how many uh, domains I've bought over the years where I thought like, hey, this is a really great idea. I'm going to buy the domain. Uh, it's $15. Let's see what happens. Um, I only own three domain, four domains right now. Um, and so those are the ones that I'm actually spending time on. But I've probably owned 20 or 30 domains in my lifetime because uh, they're cheap. And you never know. Yeah. Like it's worth if you're. If you've got an idea that's worth anything, spend fifteen dollars, buy the domain, and see where it goes. One, uh, I want to one big, one more big question before we kind of land this one, and it's it's what life as an editor is like. And you you wrote something called "How to Be a Professional Freelance Writer: Invest in Yourself." It talks about the email address. It talks about websites. Also talks about. I think it ends up you've gotten some really bad pitches and attached to those pitches is sometimes a very steep price for said bad pitch. So I want to know what should, what, what do writers need to know about being an editor? Like what are we doing totally wrong? What are we doing? That's annoying. What are we doing? That's actually, you know, hurting us and, and creating a barrier being accepted into a publication and advancing our writing careers? So I can't speak for any publication except for ours. And I what what bugs me is the inauthenticity of some of those pitches and emails. Um, and so I mentioned in that piece that you know MailChimp has great automation tools um, where if somebody doesn't click a link in the email, then it sends them a reminder email which is, it, those are great marketing tools if you're marketing a product. Um, if you're marketing yourself as a pitch, it's terrible. And I get, I can't tell you how many I get a day that's like, hey, I haven't heard from you and I just wanted to follow up and um, you didn't click on my email or you didn't respond. And I get those all the time and I don't respond because it's not worth my time. Um, just like everybody else, we have a finite amount of time in our day. Um, you know, we, we balance that amount of time with our own creative pursuits, our own family, our own jobs, our own, you know, every, everything else. And so when I sit down to go through the publications, uh, email and, uh, and submissions, um, you know, I've got, I've got finite time and I don't want it to be wasted on things that are completely distracting from that. And so I'm a big believer that, our publication has very clear submission guidelines and style style guides. Um, most major publications have a form of submission rules and style guides. Take the time to read those. Read, you know, about the publication you're pitching. Read a number of their pieces to see what they're looking for. What how what either formula or standard style do their their pieces have? 
Um, and then personalize the pitch email. If it's just, hey, and I get I I get this so many times during the day, it says, dear writingcooperative.com, which is clearly just some you know script that's pulling out the contact information. Um, <laughs> I'm not writing cooperative.com. I have a name. It's clearly available on the website. Um, Jessica and Sand, who are the other people who are behind the writing cooperative, they have names as well that are clearly available on the website. And so take the, the even if it only takes you five minutes to skim through the, the guide and figure out who you're addressing the email to, it makes a huge amount of difference. Um, and so, you know, that that's one of the things that I just that my biggest pet peeve is somebody wasting my time um, because I I would rather be doing other things. I'd rather be promoting pieces that are following the rules that are worth uh, editing um, and investing my time into than just seeing something that's completely ignored what we're talking about. We get submissions all the time that have nothing to do with writing. And so, you know, talk about wasting an editor's time. Um, just those things are easy to do. Um, and if you don't do them, speaking again for myself, it puts you in a really bad light um, for any kind of connection moving forward. And so first impressions are huge, um, especially when you're making a cold pitch to an editor via email or uh, their submission form, whatever their process is. And so don't waste it, you know, <laughs> spend the, spend a few minutes, invest that time in yourself to um, to really make that impression count. That's incredibly valuable. I think even outside of the writing world, you know, it's first impressions matter. Take the extra second. It may be convenient to send the bulk this yep. morning, but could you wait till tomorrow afternoon and make sure that every single one of those was at least personalized to the right name rather than calling you writingcooperative.com? Yep. <laughs> 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 um, I want to thank you for your time here. And before I let you go, selfishly, my curiosity is what's next? You know, what are you working on? What ideas are floating around your head that have yet to land on paper? So, um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's floating around in my head right now. Um, and so, you know, we're, we've got a conversation of amongst the three of us at the writing cooperative of, what our next project is. We just kind of wrapped up a um, six or seven week challenge for people to finish their book. We gave away a book publishing package with um, Book Baby, that huge prize. Wow. The woman who won started writing her book, I think in 1996. Um, wow. And so uh, like finally had the inspiration to sit down and finish it and she won the contest. And so I was really excited wow. to give her the prize. Um, and so like, that was a huge project. Um, you know, we, we've got our comedy show that we're trying to do, um, on zoom with some comedy writers and do a little stand up and, uh, and talk about the creative process of writing comedy. Um, and so we're exploring different ways to, um, again, focus on community. And so, especially right now, everybody around the world is kind of in the same boat where for the most part in our houses um, and writing in and of itself is often a very isolated um, practice. And so we're really trying to leverage the, uh, the community aspect of the writing cooperative to say, how can we bring people together, even if it's digitally, even if it's remotely to, uh, to learn from each other, to encourage each other um, and to help each other grow. And so um, that's what, you know, we're looking at for the cooperative in terms of my own writing. I, I published something, uh, I think it's going live on Thursday. And so I'm back to that, like what's rolling around in, in the back of my head phase and what's going to bubble up to the surface again. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's what's working on. And so um, sky's the limit right now. And, you know, we'll, we'll see where kind of things land, but um, I'm one to just kind of throw a lot of ideas out in the air. Like I said about the domain, let's, let's see what kind of ideas we can come up with and then what, which ones kind of land and bring to uh, fruition is, is kind of an exciting process. That's exciting. And for, for your personal ones, where can we be following you? So I am at Justin Cox on Twitter, Instagram, Medium, 
Um, I'm uh, the Justin Cox on Facebook and uh, LinkedIn. I didn't get to, I, I was a little too late in requesting the, the Justin Cox name on that, those ones. Um, but but justincox.com is my domain. And like you said, it links to literally everything that, uh, that I've yeah. got out there. And so um, justincox.com is the easiest place to go. Yeah, that's spectacular. That's, I, I would encourage every reader, every writer to look at that and say, this is probably a good way, a good template for how I could create a website because it's, it's compact and it gets you exactly where you need to be for then for the reader then to understand and learn more about you. Justin Cox, thank you. Um, thank you for taking time out of your week, uh, especially out of this time and to bring such a calm and focused demeanor at a time of uncertainty and, and teaching us about you can respond to fear two ways and you can just really believe in yourself, trust yourself. And I'm excited to go back and rediscover your writing as well as be first in line to consume the new pieces coming out and share this with everyone. So thank you for coming on the rough draft and I look forward to talking to you again. Well, thank you, Richie. Thank you for having me on this. It was a lot of fun today. Believe in yourself, choose growth over fear. Trash your art. Invest in yourself. Justin left us today with a menu of life lessons that reach far beyond just our writing practices. So thank you, Justin, for joining the Rough Draft. A way that I invest in myself is meditation. And Half Moon Yoga Meditation, partner with the Rough Draft, really makes it easy. So thank you again for making conversations like this possible. Also, thank you to Golden Root, caffeine-free, turmeric latte mix, original, sugar-free, kind of have it all, hot, cold. You are the real deal, Golden Root. Thank you as well for your contributions to the Rough Draft. I'll see you all next week for another stimulating conversation.